Hello and welcome to this evening's Mansfield Public Talk. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Mountfield. I'm the principal at Mansfield College and I'm delighted this evening to be, or this evening UK time at least, um, to be introducing two old friends of uh, Mansfield College, um, Paul Solman and Joe Klein, who um, in an unbashful moment I hope will turn on their cameras. Um, there we are, Paul, um, and Joe's just coming I think. Yeah, there he is. Um, so uh, Paul and Joe, who are this evening going to have a conversation um, on reporting America, are um, two of the best people one can possibly think of to do that. Um, Paul is a journalist who has specialised in economics since the 1970s, um, where he's been the business and economics, well, since 1985. In fact, he's been the business and economics correspondent for PBS NewsHour, and he also has forays into art reporting. He also has a career teaching people to think about politics and reporting of politics. And from 2007 to 2016, he was a faculty member at Yale University's International Security Studies Programme, um, as well as lecturing at the Yale Young Scholars Programme. And in 2016, uh, we were delighted to have him at Mansfield College um, as a visiting fellow. So it's lovely to see you again, Paul. Great um, Joe Klein, um, he no longer uh, anonymous, but um, very famous as anonymous, is um, an award-winning journalist. Um, and he's worked for many um, publications, including um, Time Magazine, uh, The New Yorker, Newsweek, um, and is um, currently uh, reviews books for The New York Times. But he's also um, an author of seven books, um, including the number one bestseller, Primary Colors, which for years, he um, hid his light under a bushel with that one, um, but was eventually um, outed with uh, clever use of um, uh, computer analysis um, by other journalists, which just goes to show it takes a, an investigative journalist to catch an investigative journalist. Um, his latest book, Charlie Mike, um, was in fact uh, written in my house uh, when he was a visiting fellow um, at Mansfield College, Oxford, between 2013 and 2014, when he remembers the weather as bad, but everything else as um, pretty good, I think. So it's really nice to see you both here again. Um, Paul and Joe are going to uh, have a conversation um, for about uh, 35, 45 minutes um, about some of the issues that they see in Reporting America today. Um, do feel ple free, please, to ask questions in the Q&A box. Don't wait if the question occurs to you. Put it in the Q&A box and then I will fish them out and um, field them uh, when Paul and Joe get to a convenient point. Um, but anyway, this evening, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, off you go. Uh, yes, the weather wasn't great, but <laughs> Trinity term, but everything else was. Uh, it's not great it. now. It's even worse now. It's a terrible summer, but never mind. <laughs> really, well, it's, mm. uh, but everything else exceeded expectations, mm. I have to say. Mm. It was really, to, uh, to be there was uh, amazing. Made friends, some of whom I think may be on the call, Paul Lodge, among them. Um, and so, and you and Helena and... It was it was really terrific. I, I'm lucky in that I, by covering economics, I have sort of been able to steer clear of. Uh, I'm not in the headlights. I'm not in the crossfire because I have been able to. And 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 the news PBS NewsHour people should know is pathologically even-handed show, which is why it has had rising uh, audience for for years now, where most. Every other broadcast news show in America, TV news show, has uh, got, has a much smaller audience, uh, and I think it's because we're we're so famously e even-handed uh, to a fault. Sometimes some would certainly argue, but so so in reporting America, I've been I haven't been in the crosshairs. Uh, but that said, I'm certainly aware <laughs> of what's going on and following what's going on. Uh, and when I was there in 2016, I gave a, one of these talks in person, I, I think one and, and then I was on a panel for another. And I started out by saying this was May of 19 of 2016. So Donald Trump had just become the, I think had just become the, the Republican, the presumptive Republican nominee. Uh, and I showed uh, in a PowerPoint what the prediction markets were saying his chances were of winning the election. Prediction markets being an open market, there's one in America called Predict It, 
and predict it has lots of uh, betters putting their money where their brains are in terms of thinking about what is going to happen, right? And prediction markets are often thought to be the most accurate uh, predictors of what's going to happen because people are actually putting their money there and taking into account all the information. Anyway, right. when I did that, he, Donald Trump's chances of winning the election were uh, 29%. And I said, that, and to the people in the junior common room there, uh, so now it may be reassuring to many of you, but if I told you that there's a 29% chance that there's a bomb here in the junior common room, you're all going to be fighting each other to get out the door and may get hurt just in the process. So that there's nothing to be uh, reassured about by hearing that it's 29%. I, I didn't think Donald Trump was gonna win. Uh, one night at Balliol and the Balliol betting book, I bet against a guy, a bottle of port to a bottle of something or other uh, that he would lose. So it's not to say that I, you know, was had the foresight to, to think that he was actually going to win, but the chance was large. I knew he had a, three chances in chance of winning according to the prediction market. And sure enough, he did. Now, the, then the rest of the talk was the same as what Joe and I are going to talk about tonight. Uh, tonight, your time. Um, which is why, why, how could he have that much support? And the point I made then was that there's enormous resentment in our country, in your country, <laughs> all over the Western world and all kinds of other places, but tremendous resentment of people like us, uh, of you guys and 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 us uh republicans the people who identify now as republicans hate pe what we stand for the cosmopolitanism uh, uh they to the point that they they demonize people like us to say that we're pedophiles uh, we have satanic cults literally i mean uh literally they think that there were Satan, were Satan worshipers, uh, and certainly there were election thieves, right? That we figured out some way that nobody can see to have stolen, to stolen uh, the election. And my basic point then and now as much, if not more than ever, is be, that it's a result of the different statuses. Uh, Helen noticed that I uh, put a uh, product placement here in my screen. Uh, which is Michael Sandel's book, The, uh, the Tyranny of Merit. Uh, and we can talk, Helen and I, we're gonna talk maybe a little bit more about how personalized you can make that in terms of, of Oxford itself. Uh, but it's that notion that we are somehow better. They, or they, we think that we're better. We think that they are worse. They then think they're the authentic ones and we're the pretenders or the imposters or the people who are trying to take over a genuine feeling on their part. Uh, and that's, that this all comes down to a, uh, in my view, fundamentally a clash over, over status. Um, and it makes me very worried. Uh, I, I, I'm viscerally anxious as Joe will uh, note and has, since we've been friends for 50 years, uh, the uh, I'm always viscerally anxious. So is he. <laughs> so is he. Uh, I think yeah, I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. So is he. And I think it where it's bred in the bones. So that's part of it. So you can discount the anxiety to some extent. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that with the vote, with what's going on, with uh, changing voting regulations and trying to and successfully uh, intimidating uh, voting elect, uh, voting officials that we're in for potentially, again, it's just, you know, don't know the future, just what am I worried about? I'm worried about what happens in the future with regard to democracy in America. Joe? Yes. Well, Paul, first of all, um, it is really wonderful to be back as part of the Mansfield community, uh, even if uh, it's virtually. Um, I had a wonderful time there and, um, and hope to return soon. Um, and uh, yes, I'm anxious. And uh, I wanted to um, pick up on Paul's point here and tell you a story uh, that's 45 years old. Um, 
Back then in 1975, I was the Rolling Stone Washington bureau chief. And our star writer was Hunter Thompson, who wrote Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail and Fear and Loathing um, uh, in Las Vegas. And one night he was in town and we went out to a bar with another Rolling Stone writer, Timothy Krause, who said that um, when he was a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Morocco, about half the dogs were rabid. So every time you'd see a dog, you'd run in the other direction. Um, and Hunter and I began to play with that and wonder what percentage of dogs would have to be rabid uh, for you not to run in the other direction. And we worked it down to, you know, it, when it got to be about 5% of the dogs being rabid, um, it was probably, we thought, well, then, no, we went to zero, <laughs> actually. You know, you just didn't want to risk it. And, um, but ever since then, in my mind, it's been the, you know, the mad dog principle. And as I traveled the world and covered uh, uh, wars and revolutions and guerrilla movements, it seemed to me that 5%, if 5% of the population was militantly opposed to the government, the government was in trouble. And now, we have a situation in the United States where, you know, Paul, where uh, I guess it's a different 30% of the, you know, figure, but 30% of the population simply does not believe in reality as we experience it. They have, um, my mentor was uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and he once said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And now we have 30% of the American people who um, feel that they're entitled to their own facts, that the election was stolen, as, as Paul said, that there are all these various weird conspiracies abroad in the land, um, that, that, uh, in, uh, that the media, uh, the trusted, you know, formally trusted sources of media are, uh, are lying to you. And um, the question is, how did we get to this point? And it's, it, it, it's been a 50 year journey, I think, uh, uh, that began with, uh, I mean, Paul and I grew up in a world where, uh, except for his parents, everybody else just trusted the, <laughs> the American government. You know, Paul was a red diaper baby. From, I was taught means, in school. By the way, which means that my parents were both members, my mother for much longer, my father for a very short period of time, members of the Communist Party of the United States. That's what right. a red diaper baby is. Um, we were brought up to think that um, America had fought eight wars and won them all because God was on our side. And that with a couple of clunkers included, you know, American presidents were paragons of virtue and wisdom. And then in the 1960s, the balloon burst. There was the war in Vietnam, which clearly was a very, very uh, bad war. And then there was Richard Nixon, who in his attempt to cover up um, how bad the war was, uh, created, you know, committed a number of crimes and was in effect impeached, was tossed out of office. And from that point on, the unanimity, um, the consensus of the society began to shatter. Um, and over, over the course of my 50 years as a journalist and 11 presidential campaigns, God help me, um, what happened over time was that the, the proper default position for journalists is skepticism. But over the last 50 years, that has switched, moved into the direction of cynicism. And, you know, cynicism is the belief that other people are only in it for their own good, that there is no larger good. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's a kind of intellectual convenience. Uh, I've always believed that Cynicism is what passes for insight among the mediocre. Um, but that's where we are right now. We're in a place where very few people trust our government. And the question is, 
whether or not you could have a democracy where um, 30 percent of the people don't believe in it. Yeah. The, uh, my take on this is, on what's happened is that we're in, call it the third industrial revolution uh, that's, that's grafted onto or that has been uh, taken over by, call it Reagan, Thatcher, neoliberalism, uh, to use a fashionable uh, term. <laughs> and, that, uh, and that what's happened is, and, and that has accelerated the processes which the third industrial revolution, if you want to call it that, uh, has 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 initiated, and so and so that this gap, this status gap, has gotten wider and wider, and and more and more visible with the advent of you know social media and, and ways in which we can all see how the how the other one lives. I want to go back because I want to I want to strengthen my case for status. Okay, so I, I so they, I'm getting a little uh, Oxfordy here or something like that. So. So go back to Oxford. Uh, Adam Smith was there. You all may remember uh, remember from what you've read, not from having uh, met him. Uh, and, and I just want to quote him saying, in the University of Oxford, the greater part of the public professors have for these many years given up altogether even the pretense of teaching. Now, this is, remember, a long, long time ago. And things have certainly radically changed. Uh, particularly at Mansfield, where it used to be, of course, a, uh, a entirely clerical school, as was Oxford yeah. itself. Yeah. And Paul, I need to tell you that the new uh, director of the Rothermere American Institute, which is behind Mansfield, is yeah. also called Adam Smith, but he's a very yeah. different animal. So just yes, to be I clear, know. it's the old, you know, 18th yeah, century yeah, Adam is, Smith. I think Phil's talking about Smith, the director of the Rothermere. I don't want to get him into trouble. Adam Smith <laughs> wrote the, an inquiry into the cause, uh, well, uh, the nature and causes of the wealth of nations in 1776 came out three three months before our American Revolution. Okay, um, uh, but here's what he wrote in first in 1759, and then was revising this book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, when he died in 1791. Uh, and this is my this is where I'm beginning to take my belief in the importance of status uh, from. Uh, quote: You'll excuse this. This is a little long. The present state of degradation and contempt into which the greater part of the universities have fallen in almost every part of Europe arises principally first from the large salaries uh, which in some universities are given to professors and which render them altogether independent of their diligence and success in their professions. And secondly, from a great number of students who in order to get degrees to be admitted to exercise certain professions are obliged to resort to certain universities of this kind, whether the instructions which they are likely to receive there are, are or are not worth the receiving. That's introductory to things are as they were and have become more like they were than I would have ever imagined now from the theory of moral sentiments. From whence then, this is, this is my answer to the question that Joe was raising, from whence then arises that emulation which runs through all the different ranks of men and which are the advantages which we propose by that great purpose of human life, which we call bettering our condition, to be as observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, complacency, and approbation are all the advantages which we can propose to derive from bettering our condition. It is the vanity, not the ease or the pleasure which interests us, but vanity is always founded upon the belief of our being the object of attention and approbation. The rich man, just a little more, in his, in his riches, glories in his riches, because he feels that they naturally draw upon him the attention of the world. At the thought of this, his heart seems to swell and dilate itself uh, uh, within him, and he's, the, and he's the fonder of his wealth upon this account than for all the other advantages it procures him. The poor man, on the contrary, is ashamed of his poverty. He's speaking of Oxford today, of us speaking at Oxford and the, the enormous honor that that actually confers on us, we could tell our friends they would be blown away that we're, we're, we're giving a talk at Oxford today. It's being on public TV in front of 2 million people and more on radio as I was last night. Uh, it's being on the front page of the New York Times book review as Joe will be this very Sunday talking about uh, books on Daniel Moynihan, his hero. It's being and having been at Oxford, which means I guess pretty much all of you, 
And we just don't appreciate, I think, how, how good we have it because we, through sheer luck, right, were born where we are or as, we're born as clever as we are and uh, grew up in an environment uh, which rewarded what we had. And we don't appreciate how much we'd resented if we had lucked into, if they had lucked into what we hadn't. And so I think that's the essence of everything. Joe? Well, I, uh, I disagree with Paul in one, to one extent, to, in, in one aspect of what he's saying. And I, I, I don't think that it is so much the resentment of people like us that's fueling this in among the white working class in, in America, but it's resentment of the people below them uh, or the people they had perceived as being below them in the past. And, um, oops, we're gonna turn this off. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, uh, in a few minutes, uh, but it's really important to understand that what's happened over these last 50 years has happened since the Immigration Act of 1965 was passed and a whole slew of different sorts of people, many of them Spanish speaking, have come into the country. And during the same time that uh, a concerted effort has been made to raise, um, to, to um, extinguish uh, you know, the, the, the ill effects of slavery. Um, but I'll go on to, to that. In, well, I'll do that right now. Um, one aspect of, you know, the, the, one of the biggest things that it, that's happened in my lifetime, um, it has been the, that if this is the golden age of anything, it's the golden age of marketing. When Paul and I were kids, there were three flavors of ice creams and there were three television networks. And now there are, you know, a thousand cable channels and all kinds of websites and podcasts. And the effect has been to retribalize America in a virtual way so that, um, so that you can choose a society or a tribe that is based on your own facts. And to my mind, um, uh, marketing is, is um, contrary to the American ideal. The American ideal has always been that we came from all over the globe and we were all different races and religions and we all got together and the things that bound us together, our belief in democracy and freedom um, and free enterprise, um, were more important than the things that divided us. The central principle of marketing is that the things that divide us are far more significant than the things we have in common. And you sell, you sell to the things that divide us. And so all of a sudden you will have, you know, news, uh, cable news stations that appeal to a liberal audience like MSNBC and a conservative audience like Fox. And now there are new ones like Newsmax and OAN, which appeal to complete lunatics. And, uh, and there are niches for this in the American society. And it's become far more difficult for us to come together. Um, and, uh, and as a result, the resentment of other groups has been played upon and played to. Um, there was a recent Harvard poll that showed that white working class Americans believe that they are discriminated against more than uh, black people are. And in fact, they believe that programs like affirmative action, I don't know what you call it that, but you have a uh, similarity um, and programs to give advantages for blacks to go to college um, work, uh, work to their disadvantage. And the vast changes in immigration, which brought, you know, hordes of, uh, I use that word advisedly, um, of, of Latinos to, to our country have taken away, um, they believe, uh, you know, white working class jobs. In fact, um, you know, what those immigrants have done as they've always done in American history is taken the, taken the jobs that 
white working class Americans no longer want to do. And so I think that status cuts both ways. Um, yes, they resent, you know, the East and West Coast elites. Uh, yes, they resent intellectuals. Yes, they resent the very idea of expertise. I mean, one of the major campaigns in this country now is to discredit the chief epidemiologist, Anthony Fauci, who, um, you know, who tried to steer the country through the COVID crisis. You know, you know, Tony's a phony, the right wing says. And, um, and so I think that, that, that while, you know, there is resentment of the, those above, there is far more fierce and often violent resentment of those below. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, of course. Of course. Um, uh, I'm getting an echo. I think that, that show might, might be... Somebody you want me to unmute? Yeah, 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 mute yourself. Mute yourself for the... Yeah, I think that's, that's better. I was hearing you through me. Uh, I mean, I was hearing me through you. Um, I, I don't. I don't disagree. Disagree with that. There's no question that, that we've had this. Uh, these echo chambers and this uh, increasing factionalization uh, uh, all over the world. I mean, uh, and it's certainly in part in part due to technology. It's not just selling, though, right? I'm sure Joe would agree. It, it, it that's where you get your community from. That's where you get your identity from, and that's why the term tribalism. I mean, that it is. It is who you are, and the reason that people can take such uh, extreme positions is because they're hearing from everybody else being validated, and the dynamics of groups uh, is that the group, in order to stick together, uh, comes up with a, a catechism of its own uh, that and will and will expel you from the group, right? Excommunicate you if you don't buy into the group's. Uh, craziness, whatever the group believes, okay? That would be true of any religion. Uh, think of all the religious wars from the very beginning of Christianity, right? Where the people are slaughtering each other over their definition of what their group within Christianity itself is. And of course, you can go on to you know, Shiites and uh, Sunni and, and, and all kinds of religions in all places all over the world. The, I'm only trying to highlight, I should, let me back, back up to start that sentence again. I think that Joe is is utterly right with regard to how who these people resent. They don't they don't the people who are problematic in America and who threaten American democracy is the, the people I mean. And they don't just resent us. That that's for sure. They just resent us a lot, Tony the phony, uh, and um, and uh, going to heart. You you wouldn't say. I mean. Uh, I would not tell anybody in the South, for example, that I taught at Yale. Uh, I'll, I'll end this my little bit by talking about something I am doing to try to address all of this. Uh, but or Oxford, God forbid, I mean, unless it was Oxford, Mississippi, in which case, which is named after your Oxford, uh, that might that might pass muster because it's in Mississippi. But so they 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 resent us enormously. They resent black people. They resent immigrants. Uh, just as you all, you've had the same problem throughout throughout Europe, of course. I, I'm only saying uh, that while it has always been true that people care about status, uh, you know, and go back through, you know, from Menelaus <laughs> being dissed by Paris and, and running a whole war over it to Achilles being dissed by Agamemnon to Iago whispering sweet somethings into Othello's ear. And I don't mean to be name dropping here, but you know, on and on throughout history, we all know the you know the the examples. I'm sure you can, in, as a group, can come up with a hundred more, a hundred times as many as I can. Uh, it has, it's always been true. Adam, I, I ha, Alexander Hamilton getting shot by Aaron Burr. I mean, what is all of that about? And all the wars that are taking place, and Ethiopia right now, Israeli Palestine. I mean, it's always been true, but I'm I have a suspicion that because of the amount of wealth that there is in the world, or certainly in places like ours, it's more true than ever. I, I could be wrong, of course, but I but what else is there to fight about except status? I, I guess in Greek city states it was the same kind of thing. Maybe we've returned to the Thucydidean, you know. Uh, uh, 
uh, paradigm. I, I don't know. But it and and so it wouldn't just be resentment of us, right? It would be I'm better than them and they're taking my place. People below, people above, people everywhere. But it is this sense of status loss. And uh, in behavioral economics and behavioral psychology, the one great insight of the last 20 years, I think it's widely acknowledged, is a loss hurts you more than a commensurate gain helps you. You hate losing. It's called loss aversion. It's called the endowment effect. Uh, and that's what's going on, I think, in America. And it is really, really hard for me or any of us, I think, to under to see how you get out of that. The standard, you know, standard uh, cure is uh, educate everybody, and then there won't be any difference, right? Because we'll all be equally educated. And I think that's just uh, that's a pipe dream. A pipe dream is a euphemism for that for what that for what that is. So that's that's what I that's what worries me at the core that I don't see a way out of this. Although I will after Joe talks once more, I will tell you what I'm trying to do, uh, to do my little tiny bit to do something about it, Joe. Uh, yeah, I, all of this is happening um, in the context of historic, world historic affluence, world historic peace and prosperity in our country. I was born in 1946. Um, and it has lasted all that time. I named a character in Primary Colors after this phenomenon, um, Orlando Ozio, the governor of New York. What is Ozio? Machiavelli once said that Ozio is the greatest enemy of, of a republic. And in, this, and, and in the discourses, he set up a binary system where the things that were, held a republic together um, he was especially worried about what held a republic together when it was not at war. Um, but war was something that held a republic together. It held us together and you together during World War II. Um, but also a certain amount of rigor, which he called virtu, uh, virtue. What was the greatest enemy of a republic? What was the greatest threat to coherence? Ozio, indolence, the fact that when people lost, you know, began lost their rigor, uh, by which he meant their their citizenship, and their 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 notion of citizenship as something very active, um, then a republic started to get into trouble. And what we've experienced in the United States during my three quarters of a century is the greatest experiment in ozio in human history. And it's very hard to run a democracy when, you know, in a time of indolence. It's very hard when, you know, when the new technology, te you know, first television, then the internet, you know, uh, makes it, make, makes people passive observers of what they're seeing rather than active participants in it. Um, it is, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book that I wrote in Helen's bedroom, which is really kind of a, a weird way to put it. But I, I um, Helen wasn't there at the time. Um, but, but, uh, but I had spent time uh, embedding with our troops um, at a very ripe old age in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I looked at these young people who were sent off to fi fight stupid wars um, and who were doing it with dignity and courage and humanity. I watched American troops govern towns in, um, in Afghanistan and do something that no one in human history had ever done. They would ask the people in the towns, what do you want? We've got some money. Do you want us to dig a well? Do you want us to... Um, do you want us to uh, build a school? What do you want? And um, in the act of doing that uh, and watching them, I saw that they had a real notion of community and importance, you know, of the importance of community, of the importance of brother and sistership, 
sisterhood. In fact, you know, the only two groups in America that I've met who call each other brother, brother and sister are uh, trade unionists and the military. And um, that, and, 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 and I came to the conclusion that the biggest thing we had lost as a society during this time of Ozio was that sense of community. And the sense of community was dependent on a sense of active citizenship. You can't do democracy without citizens. And I don't know how we get back in a time of indolence and passivity to a culture of active citizenship, but, and here is, here is the, uh, the, the really elegant toss to my dear friend, Paul Solman. Um, one way is to bring people together um, who might not normally get together. So over to you, Paul. <laughs> right, and thank you. <laughs> that was an elegant toss for sure. Uh, yeah, so I said before that, that I, I have my own little way of trying to do something about this, these problems um, because I do actually fervently believe that we all have more in common than we have that separates us. Uh, I don't care if you're a janitor or an Oxford Don. Um, and um, so about two and a half years ago, I uh, formed a student of mine from Yale, this, the grandson of the historian, some of you may know, David McCullough, an American historian, um, an historian of, Amer uh, historian of America, American president. Um, he came back from a year, I'm sorry to say, in Cambridge, not uh, Oxford. Uh, I think of it as the obligatory M. Phil of uh, Ivy League students uh, in America. And um, said, uh, can, I, can we get together? I'd like to talk about what to do with the rest of my life. He was, he was almost going to be a Marine, Joe. Um, uh, and uh, I said, sure, and we started talking. He said, what have you been thinking about? And I said, well, I've been trying to figure out some way of getting uh, the var to bridging the various divides in America, north, south, rural, urban, red, blue, that is Republican, Democrat. Uh, and uh, I, like Joe, have been all over the place and all over the world, and, you know, and that's why I believe that people have more in common, because People like Joe and me can get along literally with anybody and befriend anybody anywhere in the world. And so even the status difference, uh, which we of course never e emphasize, uh, it can be surmounted just by pure human affability and caring for the other person, listening to the other person and so forth. Anyway, he and I started a group which is now uh, a real thing, a real nonpartisan, nonpolitical, nonprofit called the American Exchange Project. I would urge you all to look at it, although it is a domestic foreign exchange program. And the way it works is high school seniors, second half of their senior year, they've already gotten into college or started on their uh, career path going to, to work. And so no high school knows what to do with high school seniors in this country. And they're the, the last of the 12 years that you start in first grade and end in 12th grade. And uh, so the schools don't know what to do with them. Uh, and so we get them together online to make friends from Louisiana and Massachusetts and California and Texas uh, in moderated uh, discussions about anything is a hot dog, uh, as a Frankfurt or a, uh, a sandwich or not, uh, uh, games that they play and so forth, and political uh, things, anything they want to talk about. Uh, and then after having made friends for the, for throughout that second semester of their uh, senior year, say March to uh, June, uh, they will visit, paid for by us, visit each other's communities, get involved in the local thing that's happening in that community. It's the state fair in uh, you know uh, Norwalk, Ohio, or Milan, Ohio. It's the rodeo in Cody, Wyoming. It's the uh, Kentucky Derby in, in Tennessee, in, in Kentucky, in Tennessee. Well, whatever, maybe they're gonna move it to Tennessee now because of COVID. The, but the, uh, and get people involved in each other's world. And it's a long game. We don't think, you know, it's gonna change people's minds. These people haven't, haven't even started to vote yet, but that's the point. They're not, they're not entrenched in the identities that Joe has been describing. And the, the ideal is to get them to see the commonalities amongst us 
rather than the differences heavily involved. We have a number of people from the military on as our little core staff. We're, we're reaching out to military um, schools all over the country and bases all over the country. So military is, is a big part of this. I'll end with this. Uh, I'm trying to do a story about this, about these efforts. There are thousands of them. There are some six plus thousand of them, according to someone who's chronicling this at Princeton University in, in this country, in the United States. Small, some of, them, some of them very small, some of them much larger, like Braver Angels, uh, if people have heard of that. Uh, and so I did an interview this week with two, three women who, after the killings of people at an abortion clinics in the 1990s in, in a uh, Boston suburb called Brookline, got together from the opposite sides of the abortion debate, moderated, uh, initiated by a moderator, in fact, uh, to, to talk. It was all private for years. They remain friends. And I interviewed the moderator and one staunchly anti-abortion person and one staunchly pro-choice uh, Episcopalian minister, all women, uh, about what that process entailed. They haven't changed their minds one bit. In fact, the anti-abortion woman told me she's more firmly convinced of her position than ever. But she also said, when I asked, do you love each other? She said, we have great affection for each other. We're friends. We will do things for each other. And at the very least, they are all opposed to, staunchly uh, committed to not having the differences result in violence. That's the idea of the American Exchange Project. How hopeful am I? I think about Joe's 5% mad dog rule and I'm very scared. That's why I'm scared because there are a lot more mad dogs in America than 5% these days, as Joe said. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to do. And Joe and I have talked about this because he's been involved with these, these people who we met in Charlie Mike, uh, Team Rubicon, who, who have been doing good things all around the world uh, in this same spirit. I leave the last word to you, Joe. Yeah, and you want to turn on your, you want yes. to unmute, there you go. I have unmuted now, um, and I want to close um, on an unexpected um, note of optimism. Um, I got to live a really ridiculously lucky life. I spent 50 years um, traveling the world, and it sure beat working, even in war zones. And I remember... Uh, back in 2009, I was in Iran and I was at a cocktail party and the alcohol was flowing. <laughs> uh, parties in Tehran really are a blast. Um, but anyway, I was talking to these two guys who had been educated in the United States. One was an engineer and the other was a doctor. And the engineer kept on coming back to the States for um, uh, for, you know, for uh, conferences, professional conferences. And the doctor asked the engineer, so what's it like over there? Um, and the engineer said, you wouldn't recognize the place. They don't have any Americans left. And I kind of wondered what that meant. And then two weeks later, I found myself in Arkansas, which is why, you know, it was, my life has been so amazing and I've been so lucky, but I was at a town meeting that the last Democratic um, United States Senator, a woman named Blanche Lincoln, she may be the last uh, in American history, uh, given where Arkansas has gone over the last 20 years, um, was she was having a town meeting with a thousand um, all white people. And it was a mess. They were screaming questions at her. They wouldn't let her finish. They were, you know, they were um, screaming crazed, half crazed Rush Limbaugh and Fox News talking points at her. And all of a sudden the light, you know, the light bulb went off and I realized what the conversation in Iran had been like, had, had been about. For these people, for these thousand white, mostly elderly Americans, um, 
there weren't any American, many Americans left. There weren't many American jobs. The manufacturing jobs had all gone away. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, all of the motels and uh, petrol stations in town were owned by South Asians, um, many of them from Gujarat, from uh, uh, in India. And who are those people? And where did they come? They look like black people, but they have straight hair. Who are they? And then there's the, all these Mexicans rushing across the border and they won't even speak English. And my granddaughter just came out as a lesbian and my grandson is dating someone from Malaysia. I want my country back. And I realized that as ugly a scene as this was, uh, there were two possible points of optimism. One was this, these folks were gonna die off <laughs> eventually. I mean, demographics are on our side. Uh, that's also a big problem because it's been very rare in history. I don't know, outside of South Africa, you can name a place where the racial majority became a minority and the, the country held together. And that's what we're facing in the United States over the next 20, 25 years. Um, but the second, the, the, the second point of optimism um, was that they still loved their grandchildren, even though they were gay or marry, you know, dating or marrying people of different races. Um, and the question ultimately for those folks is gonna be whether you choose your grandchildren or your hatred or your tribe. And, um, and I suspect that a fair number of them over time will begin to choose their grandchildren. And the third thing that makes me optimistic are, are programs like the one that Paul just described to you. Um, I've been part of an effort uh, to elect uh, recent veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan to the United States Congress of both parties as long, and we will give them money as long as they do one thing, that is sign a pledge to join a bipartisan caucus and talk about these issues that they disagree with. We have 22 members, it's called the four country caucus, equally divided between Democrats and Republicans and in a very, very difficult time to do that. But I think that, um, if we can, if we if we can emphasize those sorts of eff efforts, if we can make that, if we can make service to our country a part of our a necessary part of our of, of our resumes, you don't get a good job unless you've done some sort of service. I think if we can do that, we might be able to crawl back towards some kind of commonality and humanity. And um, uh, and while I worry about the mad dog principle an awful lot, and there are days when I'm very depressed, um, there are also days when I have a veteran come visit um, or I see, the, see my kids and what they're doing um, that I feel hopeful for the country. Um, and, uh, and I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you both. Um, that's amazingly stimulating thoughts and um, observations. And do please, I have plenty of questions for you, but anyone else who wants to ask questions, stick them in the chat box and I'll get through as many as I can. What really seems to come across from both of what both of you have been saying is two really strong themes. One of which is that people have lost or perceive themselves as having lost in America a sense of belonging. And they're kind of watching, they feel themselves outsiders rather than parts of communities. And you've both suggested ways that you might encourage people to, to, to reach out across desire, divides and to um, imagine themselves to be part of communities um, in an empathetic way. Um, but the other is this sense of resentment, resentment to those perceived as elites, to those perceive, who perceive themselves or perceived to perceive themselves as above you, and to those who you perceive as below you, who don't perceive themselves as below you. And it does seem to me that a big part of that may be um, the point that Paul and I were talking about, and, and it's discussed in, in that 
Michael Sandel book that he's product placed to his left on my screen about the tyranny of merit, that people have internalized a sense of shame, that we, we talk so much about a meritocracy while people are losing status or losing money or community, that they feel implicitly criticized for that. It's their fault. And then they turn on the people who they think are unfairly blaming them. And I do wonder how we can get people out of a sense of shame, because I think that's a very big part of it. You know, in the in in the talk I gave in 2016, I said that people like me, I said, you know, something a, a gag that goes around in America is we think they think we think they're stupid. They're right and we're right. I always got a laugh when I'd say that. I said at that talk they suspect that we're making that joke and laughing at it. And that one thing that I think it's incumbent on all of us to do, and I, I try my darndest, is to, to show respect in whatever ways. My, my best calling card when I'm in the South is to apologize for being a New England Patriots football fan. Right. Because the New England Patriots are notoriously uh, pushing the envelope, if not outright cheating team that has done unbelievably, uh, statistically improbably well for most of the last 20 years. Uh, and, and I apologize. A, it shows that I'm a football fan, which is already a point of significant commonality. It has nothing to do with being, you know, Yale, whatever, you know, elitist. B, I know that they think my team is a team of assholes, and I acknowledge that and apologize for it. Uh, but I'm also saying, hey, look, it's this is my identity, and I'm sorry. And I think that is also a point of commonality. Uh, and that that's been my my most effective icebreaker. So one thing you can do is, of course, join one of these groups, the one Joe's talking about for country. There's another one in Congress where I interviewed two guys, just the other two congressmen yesterday, I think, day before, uh, who were trying to do the same thing. And it's a, the the Committee on the Modernization of Congress, uh, uh, Congress, sorry, Select Committee on the, and they've been renewed now. And they, the Republicans and Democrats sit next to each other. They don't sit apart from each other. They convivialize. They do a whole bunch of things to break down all the barriers. Uh, and it was a, a congressman from South Carolina and one from Washington State who I was on with. And who are clearly friends now. And, uh, mm -hmm. but always I notice that, that with the guy from South Carolina, self self-deprecating and a little anxious because he's he's now talking to people from the elites. Uh, and so that that I feel, uh, I, I still feel that. And how do you break that down by making friends and going, I'm just as much of a jerk as you are. And I, I'm just as pathetic as you are. And, uh, and we're all in it together and we all have grandkids and we're all scared of dying and uh, getting sick at my at our age and- um, there's, a, there's a lot to overcome though. I mean- No, 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 huge, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the most destructive words spoken in American politics over the last quarter century were not uttered by Donald Trump, but by Hillary Clinton when, he call, when she called his supporters a basket of deplorables. Yeah. You see that, you hear that everywhere. It was the final, confirmation of what they feared and resented all along. And, um, yep. you know, and I think that, um, I think Paul's right. Part of the strategy is, is, to, is, is to be able to convince people that we can be deplorable too. Um, uh, but, you know, I found, I spent a lot of my time uh, going on road trips through the country. Uh, just in order to prevent myself from being locked into uh, Washington affairs and foreign affairs. And I always found that, you know, having a, having a, a beer with somebody um, and talking about stuff was great. And as a journalist, I found that my two most effective questions were, no kidding, and really, 
<laughs> you know, and that would get them, you know, they, it, would, it would be yeah. me showing appreciation for yeah. things that they were saying. I might disagree with them. And if I did disagree with them, I'd get into that a little bit later down the road, but I was certainly going to show respect for what listen. they were thinking. And listen. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I'd also mention Team Rubicon, which is uh, a group of thousands and thousands of veterans, including Prince Harry, um, who do international disaster relief. Uh, I, to me, one of the most moving experiences of my life was to go on a deployment with Team Rubicon to Oklahoma after they had the tornadoes there and to watch um, all these people helping other people. And I think, you know, you cannot speak enough for the bomb and the wonderful effects of service. Yeah. So, Joe, is one of the things you're saying, because one of the questions here is how you can open the valve of someone's echo chamber. Great phrase, great way of putting it. Mm -hmm. They're happy with their little closed world. How do you get in? And I think it sounds to me as if what you're saying is in real life and with some humility and an effort to make connection to see beyond. Well, you have to go there. Mm. I mean, you really have to go there. I, one of the things that drives me crazy about watching television news um, is that none of the very, very few of the commentators they have on, and um, Paul Solman is, you know, an absolutely brilliant uh, exception to this. Very few of them actually go out and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Very few of them actually go out and, um, and, and listen. And um, they are hired for their beauty now and for their glibness. Um, and there aren't the news budgets anymore to send people like me out in the country asking folks questions. Um, but I remember this one time I was in a town in Iowa and I was having a meeting with 12 couples. All the women were Democrats, all the men were Republicans. And they said to me, you know, you guys from the East, why do you spend so much time writing about and showing the Tea Party and these extremists on TV? We know exactly who those people are. They're the crazies who go to town meetings and uh, city council meetings and complain about the fluoridization of the water. Um, you don't spend enough time talking about the vast majority of us who are essentially, well, we're married to each other. <laughs> we're, in a, you know, we have differences, but we're in agreement. So somebody here has, who says, has a son who's a local TV anchor in the States who said he's got more cynical and less about his business and about the government. And how can he regain his initial enthusiasm about his occupation? So do you think that feeds into some of what you're saying? Do you think we can? Oh, yeah. No, no. For me, the, 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 always the way to when I found myself getting cynical, especially having to deal with politicians all the time, it was to go out and talk to actual human beings, regulation human beings, because they didn't speak in sound bites, and they would always, you know, they, they, they would often be a moment of surprise. The depressing thing is that over time in the 11 presidential campaigns I covered, you would find that you went and talked to people and within five minutes you could tell what cable TV station they were watching because they were giving you sound bites back. Yeah, and that's why we're, that's why we're working with younger people where that has, hasn't happened. But I'll tell you, in, in the American Exchange Project, there's a kid up here from the suburban Boston, uh, uh, good background, right? A, a prosperous background and so forth. He, after making friends with the folks in Texas, said, oh, I now understand something I didn't before, which is if renewable energy becomes the rule in Texas, where they have lots of sun, for example, so it, and lots of space, so it's a really good place for solar farms and, and other renewable projects, windmills and the like, they said, if that happens, the impact on the Texas economy will be like the impact that uh, has happened throughout the country uh, with regard to deindustrialization because there are so many jobs in Texas that depend on fossil fuels, you know, making the drills bits for the, for the drills and, and a million other things you can think of. Uh, 
or, or would not be surprised to hear about. And so uh, you, people can wake up and maybe a guy from, you know, uh, suburban Boston is a little more open to hearing a different point of view than another kid from uh, Louisiana might be uh, more brought up that way, you know, more to be open-minded. Uh, but the, the biggest problem we've had in the American Exchange Project, and again, we're, we were dormant throughout the pandemic, so we're really just getting started for 2022. We'll have a little project, uh, pilot project this summer. Biggest problem we've had is the problem I've been talking about all along, the, the, the tyranny of merit problem, okay, which is that the kids from suburban Boston have bigger vocabularies and nicer houses, and, and the kids from Lake Charles, Louisiana feel... Uh, if not disc, because they're being treated very nicely, but feel uh, not up to the mark, yeah. feel inadequate. And therefore, we, it's harder for us to recruit those kids. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. true of every bridging project I'm aware of. Yeah. And Paul, you've, you've talked a little bit about the, the pandemic and the, how that's stopped you in some ways bringing people together. But the other remarkable thing about the pandemic yes. is it has shown that if we need to change things really fast to try to solve a problem that affects us all as human beings, we can, if we choose to. And it enables us to see that very big changes in human behavior affect the environment. So there's a question here about whether you've thought about the environmental questions about animals in foreign trade. I mean, you can see this, this could link to the, all these questions. How do we solve them in a way that, that brings us all together as human beings? Well, save that question for a second. It was just that with regard to the person who has the anchor here in America. Yeah, yeah anchor here in America. One thing that the pandemic has taught us is that you can do just what Joe's talking about without going anywhere. <laughs> you can actually right. connect Absolutely. with people now. And I find, and I've asked a lot of people about this from CEOs to other journalists to the people I interview, they're more comfortable in this setting because there's no lights, camera, action. I'm talking now about being a TV yeah. person, right? Yeah. You don't have to sit around, wait, oh no, the lighting isn't right. Now it's just, we're all in our rooms i'm 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 now wearing <laughs> so i'm so comfortable i'm wearing shorts right <laughs> me too <laughs> yeah, there you go so i mean it's so there there's and that's all we're talking about is 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 connecting on a human way right uh, mm -hmm. so so there's i think the pandemic has actually shown us a way to do just the answer to that person's question and just what Joe was talking about. You don't have to leave the studio to go talk to, to normal Americans and they feel validated when you do. They it's feel, still better to be there though. Well, it, it, but, but I think it cuts both ways, frankly, but that's another whole discussion. Anyway, what was your question? You, your oh, point, you, well, yeah. I, was, I was just asking about the, the kinds of issues which we need to solve together. And someone, Bans uh -huh. Lum, actually talked about animals and the international trade, but there's also the environment. There's how do we solve environmental questions without leaving whole areas of the country with no jobs? Um, you know, so I suppose it is it's starting to see the, the, those angles on questions and try and get a common response. Boy, are we a long way away from from dealing with issues like that. Um, you know, in the United States, we can't even get 30 percent to agree that uh, that the vaccine is good for you. Um, you know, the assumption is things like animal rights and, in, and environmentalism are elitist issues. Right. And that um, and that anybody who raises them uh, is an elitist. Now, there are other ways to get at these issues, and they are always from the ground up. They are always from the local um, perspective. Uh, you know, the, uh, the mistreatment of a, you know, a, a polluted creek, or, you know, um, there's been a growing um, sensitivity to the uh, mistreatment of animals. Uh, from the bottom up in this country. But before we can get to the big deals, you know, especially in the environment, which is, which is not a perceived crisis for most people, um, before we can get to those, we're going to have, well, we're going to have to tiptoe into them and do it gradually and do it the way Joe Biden is doing it by selling the notion that, um, that a green economy is going to produce a lot of new and uh, and and fulfilling jobs. 
So I have a question for you from Lucinda Rumsey, who you probably remember, our senior tutor at Mansfield. Who said Hi, Lucinda. Good wishes, Hi, yes, and she's with David as well, so they're Hi, both watching. Um, but t taking that point about how you um, make people address common issues, break down envy and resentment, she says, isn't it also important to recognise that it is the rich and important elite Trump, Johnson, who e exploit and incite these concerns about status, who try to divide people. And I suppose it's in some people's interests to um, not, not to try and solve problems in, in, a, in, in the ways that you're talking about. Well, if you're opportunistic, I mean, and you see that this is happening and you want to play to that group of people, then that's what you do. I don't care if you're an elitist or coming from nowhere. I mean, the you know the fact that Johnson that Ron Johnson or or Donald Trump are elitists is is sort of beside the point. I mean the the at least from my point of view the it's what they've done is say hey wait or or uh, the best example I can think of is Josh Hawley the senator from uh, Missouri who was egging the crowd on and who comes from he was Yale Law School and mm. where where Harvard, Harvard Law School. I think the other way around, I think. But mm -hmm. anyway, Harvard and Yale, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and who's just, you know, a cynical, uh, a cynical politician who, who sees that that's, who thinks that that's how he's going to get ahead and has some <laughs> substantial reason to believe so. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that, that there is a, a bifurcation among the elites. And I think that there is, uh, among the, uh, the, the, super wealthy. I think that there are an awful lot of very, very, very wealthy folks who are now figuring out that unless we can bring the country back together again, it's going to be bad for business. And um, the only way, you know, America was most su successful uh, as a country during a time when uh, the middle class was doing well. Um, and when the union movement was, you know, the trade union movement was strong um, before globalization. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the really interesting things about Biden uh, is that he has come to understand this. And a lot of the early legislation that he's proposing is to do things that will tax the rich and build a more supple safety net for the poor. And if you do that, and, and the interesting thing is that the, you know, the elites, the Wall Street elites, I would venture to say, uh, aren't opposed to that. Yeah, I, I, I think what D Biden should be doing is giving the Congressional Medal, the, the uh, Medal of Freedom to uh, country music stars and NASCAR people. I think he, yeah. and he could do it because he comes from Scranton, Pennsylvania. He comes from a very modest background. And to embrace, because again, my point is about status here. And, and I think th to, the, to the degree that he's the anti-deplorables guy, he's the guy who says everybody into the tent. And I identify with people you identify with, you that is people who disagree with him. Th that's the most valuable thing I think he could be doing. And do you think if he does that, he can um, get people away from the the concept? And I, I mean, have someone here who, who we were talking about, Michael Young, who, who worked for Michael Young, Mansfield alum, saying, is it, it, do, does the too much choice actually disempower people and make them feel less and resentful? Can, can we get away from that in America, of all places? Too oh, much look, choice? Every Mm. Too much choice making you feel inadequate and disempowered. Well, there's and a famous well, book, The Paradox I, I, of Choice, that one of my favorite books of the last 20 mm. years uh, with a, by a guy named Barry Schwartz. And so there's, there's plenty of truth to that. Look, anything we're going to say, <laughs> with, for whatever it's worth, involves little tiny steps here. I mean, that's why the American Exchange Project is long range. So is... Team Rubicon or these two congressional committees we've talked about. This is all little by little. And we have no idea whether or not that's going to be overwhelmed by some tsunami of resentment or further resentment or whatever, whatever's going to happen in the world. But, you know, we we're both committed to, and I think all of us probably here listening in or talk, asking questions are committed to the notion, got to do something. And, but, and also, uh, you cannot underestimate 
the power, the simple power of decency. And I think that gradually, um, you know, uh, even even the most fervent Trumpers are are coming to see that Joe Biden um, isn't an evil person. He's a good guy. He's a he's he's a common guy. Um, He cares about people. And, you know, in the immediate issue that they cared most about, he he really put focused the federal government for the first time on dealing with dealing with the virus. And so if he can do that over time and if he can bribe them a little bit with child, you know, child tax credits and um, and other things like that, um, then, you know, the power of decency, the power of humanity may not sell as well uh, on TV. You know, it uh, it may not be as exciting to cover as riots and and angry white people uh, saying disgraceful things, Uh, but it does have some power. And I think that we're that Trump exhausted an awful lot of Americans and that the fact that you can go whole days now without having to think about politics, I think over time people may give Biden credit for that. And I think that that's our point of view and that I'm just looking at 538, which is probably the most statistically reliable website we have. And here's the, as of this moment, there's the approval rating and he's got a 40% disapproval rating, 53% approval. Of course, that's the flip of Trump for the last few years, but it's still 40% of Americans. And then what percentage of them are, are, literally making a very small percentage, but some of them are threatening the lives of people who work uh, at voting stations, uh, you know, trying to intimidate them out as have, you know, authoritarian regimes from throughout history to scare them off to be able to take over the process. And that's, that's what still yeah, is. Well, I, I, the, one, the one thing I'd, I'd caveat I'd add to that is that that, that statistic doesn't, um, doesn't convey intensity. No, I, no think, that's true. I think we dis- the fifty four percent who disapproved of Trump um, disapproved far more strenuously than the forty percent who dis- disapprove of Biden. That might be true. I don't know. Okay, so I would like to go on. I can't go on because we really need to um, draw this to a close um, for those who are going to go and have a have a drink in England or maybe your lunch in America. Um, but I do want to just I miss finish. the drinking part of it. Yeah, the, um, I want to finish with Stephen Blundell, another Mansfield oh, fellow hi, who also says hi to you both. Um, oh, hi, he wants, I, I've saved this question because I thought it might be a good um, place to um, end because he says, having talked so much over the last few years about Trump and how awful he's been, he wants to be more optimistic and ask you both which figure in American politics from your lifetime you think has perhaps shone out as a beacon of positive change and somebody who could point us to a brighter future. Hmm. Well, I would, you know, I would go with my mentor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who foresaw an awful lot of this. And um, and at one point when he was, was a senator from New York and was a senator from New York, but also was a philosopher. He yeah. was a kind of old-fashioned Ciceronian senator, senator who was a thinker. And, um, and what he said in the end was that these post-industrial problems, we haven't really figured out the answers to many of them yet. Um, but with luck, we may figure out a few of the answers. And that in the end, um, intellect and especially humor help. And so, you know, I'd look to him, but I would also look to the 22 members of the caucus, the military caucus that I've been involved with and um, as potential leaders uh, in this country because they, they learned how to govern under the most difficult circumstances. Um, and they know the other really important thing that we've lost track of in this country is, is just how terrible war is. You know, Donald Trump had has no idea um, 
of what he would be doing if he sent uh, kids off to Iraq or Afghanistan. And in fact, he, he wanted to bring them home. George W. Bush had no idea. Joe Biden has a better idea because his, his son, Bo, served in Iraq. But I think that the people who served and the people who know just how horrible and disgraceful war is um, are our greatest source of hope for the future. And I don't have a good answer, Stephen. I, I, um, well, I'd love to have a good answer for you or any answer, but uh, I, I don't, I've just, you know, watched Jimmy Carter, never heard of him, president. Uh, Bill Clinton, Joe knew who Bill Clinton was, but I certainly didn't. Um, so the people who will emerge, it's from a large pool of people. I, I know half a dozen congressmen, if I know that many, uh, and, and I don't know them well enough to, to, to hazard a guess. It'll all depend on all these tiny factors and publicity and money and things like that, that I, I just, I sort of don't pay attention until the end because I know I have no value added in having an opinion. So maybe it's from what you've been saying, American, every woman and every man who tried to make communities and make links and see the humanity in other people. Well, if Joe Biden is, has, is certainly something like that or the close, one of the closer, better examples I've seen. And so is Paul Solman for doing what he's doing with the American Exchange Program. We'll see if yeah. that goes. Anywhere. Well, it's a terrific idea. Thank you both so much for a fascinating evening. Um, for next week, uh, we have somebody who I think may be taking this on. Um, a little from where we are now. Um, Mickey Scott Bay Jones, um, who is going to be talking about Brave Spaces. She's an American pastor and community organizer. She's organized something called the People's Supper, where she tries to encourage people from different sides of very contentious debates, like the um, abortion debate, like well, many other debates, to talk to one another um, in a human way and uh, identify where our humanity is centered and how we can um, explore the idea of Brave Spaces. Very interesting today when we have, in this country at least, a really um, a polarity try it's sort of being played out or at least being developed, a culture war being imposed on us, I think, between how do we um, respect people um, who don't have their fair share in society and make create safe spaces for them and promote freedom of expression and, and free discussion. So this will be an interesting talk. So please do, do please join me then. Encourage anyone else to. These talks are um, open to everyone and we do try to open Oxford to everyone um, through them so that uh, we, we, we're not trying to be elitist in the um, narrow sense that Paul's talked about. So spread the word. Um, but Paul and Joe, thank you very much and come back and see us in real life soon because you both say it's better. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.